Welcome everyone to the I2B2 Transmark Foundation community meeting for March 2021. My name is Rudy Potenzo and I'll be uh, the host today. Um, our agenda, we're going to talk about, uh, first of all, the uh, upcoming community meetings uh, are, you know, we continue these meetings every month. It's the, um, if you're interested in presenting, we, we love to have guests uh, speaking at these meetings. And so if you're interested, please let us know. And uh, we'd be today, happy to today is the third Tuesday. Third Tuesday, I'm sorry, third Tuesday of every month, right? Thanks, Gil. <clears throat> um, the agenda today uh, is here. We're gonna do a, a brief uh, update. Uh, and then um, we're gonna have a, a very a, a good, good discussion on the 4CE program. So uh, without further ado, let me introduce Diane Keough, the Managing Director of the Foundation, uh, to do a welcome and uh, some updates. Diane? Hi, Rudy. Um, thank you, Rudy. Hi, everyone. Um, you can go to the next slide. I am going to really quickly just um, make a couple of announcements and then introduce the folks from 4C. Um, so um, I want you to save the date. So our June symposium is um, gonna be held virtual again, um, unfortunately this year on June 22nd and 23rd. Um, and we're in the process of putting the agenda together, um, looking for keynote speakers. We've reached out to a few people. Um, I think the thing that's most important that I wanted to mention to this group is we'd love to have some use cases be part of this. So. If you have a use case or if you know of an organization that has done something um, very interesting using um, I2B2 or, or Transmart, please let us know. We'd love to, we'd love to um, really highlight that um, at our meeting. Um, so you can go to the next slide and I will introduce. So 4C, and you can flip to the next slide, um, Rudy. So I'm really, I'm really excited um, to introduce um, the folks from 4C to give an overview around the, um, the, the work that they've done. Um, I think most of you have received the, the um, newsletter that um, the foundation uh, uh, now produces um, to try to spread the information around 4C and the work that they do. I'm not gonna go into this because uh, Griffin, Sean and, and Gabe will, will talk to you more, but certainly look for this. I think we'll, this will be at least quarterly. Um, we'll provide information around um, this, the work that, that they're doing. So next slide. Okay, so our, our guest speakers, um, Griffin Weber, um, certainly known to the, the foundation. We'll give an overview of overall overview of 4C. Um, uh, Gabe Bratt, who is um, you know really a, a person who is has been he's from Beth Israel, boots on the ground, working with COVID patients and um, and supporting this effort. Um, and then Sean will talk about uh, validating disease um, severity, and this is a, a paper that um, he published. So without further ado, I think we'll. Griffin, we'll let you, we'll stop sharing, we'll let you guys share your insights. Uh, thank you, Diane. Um, uh, as host disabled participant screen sharing. Rudy, I think you've got to make him a co-host or allow him to share. Okay, thank you for that introduction. Um, we're gonna today give an overview of 4C. A lot of you are already familiar with it, but um, it's useful to repeat things every once in a while because it's, it's grown so quickly over the past year. Um, it, it moves quickly, may have missed some things and just take a look at what we've been doing. I'm gonna first do a brief kind of technical overview of 4C and then as Diane said, John and Gabe will um, go into a couple of use cases. So we created the 4C Consortium through the foundation and led by Zach Hani out of Department of Biomedical Informatics at Harvard Medical School a year ago now, back in March of 2020. Um, at that time, many uh, national and international efforts to study COVID were launching and uh, we were involved in, in many of those as well. Um, other federated networks as well as approaches to centralizing data into, um, into enclaves. 
And what we recognize from our many years of working with ITV2 and, and Transmart data is that analyzing all these um, data sets that are being collected will only work if you, can have, if you can trust the data. So what we did is we engaged local experts, informatics people, statistics, statisticians, as well as the clinicians at our various hospitals in our community um, to iteratively improve size data quality, understand limitations of EHR data, and collect uh, and conduct real analyses um, rapidly on COVID-19 through a federated model and patient chart review. So our approach is to leverage the expertise that we have in all of our institutions. We have a, through our foundation, we have an academic users group of hundreds of institutions that we can pass into. Our goal is that we believe early intelligence is worth more than complete intelligence later. We wanna move quickly, publish results, and share lessons we've learned about the data with, other, um, uh, uh, with others, including the different networks that we're also part of. Um, our latest study had 342 hospitals at eight countries and 37,000 COVID patients that were admitted. Um, these numbers keep increasing, especially this past week as some new funding announcements became available, which had a uh, number of new institutions joining us. Uh, a theme throughout all that we do is staying close to the data. We use a federated model where we do the analyses locally at site, and we only share aggregate accounts with the rest of the consortium. We leverage local data experts and clinicians to help us refine the questions that we're studying. The so local people know the local coding practices at their institutions, and we can go back and do chart review. If you just pull data into a central location, um, that can be a lot more difficult to figure out what sort of the truth in the records were. It's different when you have somebody, a clinician, who can look at a patient's chart and tell us what was going on. We also have the ability to fix data problems. So by having um, uh, members of our consortium running queries on their ICB2 database, seeing different data problems in there, they can go and fix and correct things. And then as we iterate through this, we're, uh, we're increasingly improving the data quality and improving the trust in the, find, in the data that we have. We have two different phases. Phase one uh, is kind of taking a broad look across our international consortium. It also allows us to look across the diversity of the United States. To do this, we leverage many hospitals. We have about 300 some hospitals, I said at the moment, across multiple countries. And we could do this because what we're asking sites to do is fairly lightweight. We just ask them to run some SQL queries. It's just aggregate accounts, so there's a low regulatory barrier to participation. However, we're able to get some really useful information. We see different hospital perspectives, we see differences across region and country um, that helps us generate hypotheses and get preliminary data for what we do in phase two. So our phase two studies are about deep analysis and chart review. We take subsets of our sites that have resources and capabilities to do this. We take deep dives into their data. This may involve chart review, um, validating data through the chart review using natural language processing to extract concepts. With patient level data within the hospitals in phase two, we can run machine learning models and do complex analyses using R. We distribute a Docker image to each site. So even though we have lots of sites that have lots of different data models, like to b 2 OMOP, and others, they put all their data in CSV files on a Docker image, and that allows us to have consistency across sites. So we can develop an R script for a research study, send that out to sites, and have confidence in what's going to come back from that. By staying close to the data, we've gained some um, key insights. Uh, when we work with institutions, we're including local clinicians as well as the data managers who have had years of experience working with these electronic health records. Um, we collectively review the aggregate results to identify differences. We don't just accept the data from sites. We all take a look at each other's um, records. We look at the, uh, the, the um, strange things that pop up, the outliers, and we go back and we check to make sure these things are real. Some of the things we've learned by doing this is that hospital charge EHRs vary greatly in the availability coding and quality of key outcome measures. In the initial phase 1.0 that we started last March, we were looking at similar kind of outcomes that everyone else had, like ICU, ventilation, and death. We realized these are very um, difficult to, uh, to measure in electronic health record systems because there isn't standard coding practices for these. Um, so I think Sean will be talking about how we use um, billing codes and other proxies to get at this information. The algorithms that we developed a year ago in the spring 2020 degrade in accuracy over time. Hospital practices have changed, the disease prevalence has changed, so we have to continually refine these algorithms as just the state of COVID around the world is, um, is, is changing rapidly as well. 
Lab tests are hard. We're not the only group that's discovered this. Uh, and particularly in countries, they vary in what tests they use. Um, and within a single hospital, there can be inconsistencies in units and types of tests. So having local knowledge of what physicians are ordering for their patients, what codes are being used, um, what units are being used is really important for doing this kind of cleanup. And finally, that race and ethnicity coding varies greatly by hospital and has different meanings in other countries. In the US, hospital general report the NIH categories for race and ethnicity, but that's what they code within their local EHRs. Um, there may be you know, a dozen kind of common codes that we use in something like our shrine network, but internally within the hospitals, there may be hundreds of codes for different variations, self-reported codes, um, and there's, there's a lot of cleanup that has to be done there. When we look internationally within our consortium, there are countries in Europe that don't collect race for um, privacy specific reasons, and different parts of the world have different ideas of what race means. The United States, we collect things on American Indians and Pacific Islanders, and these categories are different than the kind of categories you would think as in a different country that has um, different populations. Our phase one approach, sites take their EHR data maybe in an ITB tour OMOP database. We had a number of sites that had other kind of custom warehouses and they extract CSV files, um, sort of plain text files, um, using SQL that we deliver to them with different files depending on which iteration of this we're using. They may include the daily counts, the number of patients, the clinical course, the hospitalization, demographic date breakdowns, diagnoses and medications over time, and laboratory test values. They generate these things locally and then upload them to a validation website that we built that checks to make sure that the files are in the right format, the data types are correct in the different columns, and then it merges it and we can visualize these data um, to um, help us identify, again, if there's additional data problems in the data or help us identify um, uh, patterns in the data and analyze it and come up with or find it. We present these on covidclinical.net. Our public website has interactive visualizations and downloads of the aggregate data set. We've been very effective with this method because it's sort of a lightweight approach and getting lots of institutions on board. Our first preprint uh, came out in only four weeks after we formed the consortium. It was later published in Nature Digital Medicine. We looked at lab trajectories of 27,000 patients. And then phase 1.1, or .1, more recent version of this, we're able to predict disease severity based on lab trajectories across um, uh, almost 350 hospitals. And Gabe will go into more detail on these studies. In phase two studies, we do manual chart review again using R scripts on Docker images um, to provide a, a standard compute environment and, uh, and, and be able to do more complex analyses on that patient level data. We still only share aggregate results, even though we have access to you know, everything that's available within an institution through the local collaborators. Essentially, we only see the, the, the results of those analyses. There are three different kinds of phase one, phase two projects that we do. We break out into different work groups. There are a number of projects that look at refining and validating our methods. Sean will talk about our disease severity algorithm and Gabe will talk about um, longitudinal analysis studies. We look at, have projects that look at understudied or underrepresented populations. Paul Avalok leads these and pediatrics and race and ethnicity. And then we have a number of disease or system specific um, projects that look at Diagnoses, risk factors, management, and outcomes, including a neurological disease study group, acute kidney injury, thrombotic events, and um, a number of others. Um, everyone is pivoting now to post acute sequelae. Um, there are different kinds of research questions that we can answer on our phase one type studies, where we're looking broadly across multiple nations, and then phase two studies where we're taking deeper dives into patient level data. In phase 1.2, we can look at what post-acute sequelae are seen on different time points after um, initial diagnosis of COVID-19. We can see how this varies by country or race and what post-acute sequelae are seen in children. Um, we have a large number of pediatric hospitals and, and patients in our network. In phase 2 studies, we're looking at whether chart review can help us distinguish um, post-acute sequelae from pre-existing comorbidities and kind of cleaning up the data to figure out what's real. Um, also looking at whether post-acute sequelae are due to the virus or the treatments that are being given to patients, such as um, extended ventilation. And then disease-specific post-acute sequelae through the various domain 
working groups. So with that, I'll end this overview, and I think we're going to switch to Sean. Yeah, we are. So um, thanks, Griffin, uh, for that excellent overview. Um, and I think as Griffin was kind of leading up to, um, one of the things that was very, very valuable about doing this with all the I2B2 groups, essentially across um, Europe, uh, Singapore, um, in uh, Korea, we had some that um, are now in India and Brazil, um, and um, across the US, and especially with ACT sites participating, um, we, we reached a great number of different and very diverse locations, and that was the strength. When you have a lot of diverse locations, though, what you have is a lot of different kinds of codes for things which are um, needs to be considered. So we had a, a problem uh, that we needed to solve because um, we wanted to understand uh, what the different trajectories for labs and courses of our patients was um, who had different uh, disease, disease severity. So for patients who are getting COVID very severely, and that's a, it's, it's a relatively small subset, right? It's only, you know, uh, uh, five to 10% who, you know, actually end up uh, with a really severe case of COVID. 50%, as you all know, are completely asymptomatic, right? I mean, it's really quite remarkable how uh, diverse uh, some of the presentation of symptoms are in, in COVID. But um, for those who get it severely, what is their, their, their hospital course? And so to do that, we really wanted to focus on patients who are in the ICU or die. Um, and the problem was that, um, it wasn't as simple as it sounds because most of the hospitals weren't getting good indicators of whether patients were in the ICU. Um, ICUs not only were, you know, in, in the heat of battle kind of being managed all over the hospital, not just in the typical ICU locations, but also it takes a while for codes to come in that say people are in the ICU. It's the billing codes and that's done with abstraction and so forth. And so it takes a while. And we wanted to get this paper out you know, quickly, right, uh, within the first few months. So people could use it as a guide for how to tell if patients are basically getting more and more severe in COVID from their lab tra trajectory. So therefore, we um, took a very practical approach. And that is, we looked at how we could use indicators that patients were in the ICU or, or died as um, just from, from things that we knew about ICU care. So for example, um, uh, you'll see we, we different kinds of labs that are ordered. So we wanted to study these uh, difficult hospital courses. We wanted to develop some kind of way that we could do it robustly, right? So we could determine robustly if they're in the ICU or, or died. And we did that by having this inclusive or based phenotype of about a hundred standard codes that were typical of patients who get into the ICU. Codes um, uh, like um, blood gases, so PCAO2s and PAO2s, those are blood gases, and people typically get blood gases and even serial blood gases when they're in the ICU. Medications like anesthetics, which are used um, uh, during intubation, or treatment for shock, like uh, epinephrine and, 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 and those kinds of um, vasoconstrictors. Different kinds of diagnoses that were given immediately to patients, pneumonias and ARDS, for example, and procedure codes that might've been uh, uh, specified like uh, ET tube insertion or mechanical ventilation. And so to our to, to the credit of, of, of especially Jeff Klan, who organized much of the validation, but of course also Griffin and Gabe and uh, everyone who basically participated in this um, uh, consortium, we were able to actually even produce the, the very logic that we used to determine if these patients were uh, severely affected by COVID as its own paper and it can be used 
Um, and it is being used as a, as a way that uh, across the country, folks can now determine severity without waiting for specific uh, ICU codes to come in. And the bottom line is that um, we could look at this and we did very carefully at uh, these 12 different hospitals. And you can see that um, each one of them could actually check the results to see if using these codes are going to determine if somebody is in the ICU or not. And it turned out that if you take these 100 or so codes and you organize them all together, that um, you can get a uh, positive predictive value, which is basically because our, our, our coding is kind of like uh, testing the situation as to whether they're in the ICU or not, a positive predictive value is probably the best statistic. And it was about 75% um, uh, predictive. Uh, the contrary, negative predictive value was 82%. And you can see the sensitivity and specificity were, were fairly high. I mean, certainly not perfect, but fairly high. And just to give you kind of a, a sense of um, what these mean to, to folks in, in I2B2, I'm gonna take you to uh, Sean Vishwani and Michelle Morris's site. Um, and I don't know if this is a good idea or not, by the way, because my internet, I don't know if you guys noticed before, but I kind of have been going in and out of Zoom. My internet is terrible today. I don't know what's wrong with my provider. So I'm on my phone. <laughs> so I'm actually doing all of this through my phone and uh, hopefully you're having a, a reasonable experience. Um, all right, so here you'll see, here's the I2B2 client. And all we're doing is having a big bunch of terms ORD together, right? So what we can do is we can actually express this in the I2B2 ontology. And we can say, okay, if we what's their illness severity? And if they have severe illness, it's determined by all these different codes, which I can show you. See, here's the blood gases. Here's the anesthetics and medications that are used typically in an ICU setting. And so what it really means, right, is that you can just pull this severe illness folder over and you'll be able to do a query for anything, you know, how many patients, you know, are on this medication and end up dying and were severely ill versus ones that weren't severely ill in a typical uh, I2B2 query. All right. Well, thank you, Sean. I think wait, are we done? Wait, or... wait, so, okay. no, I, I, it's my, I'm sorry. It's my internet's kind of like really crappy. I'm really sorry about that. It's um, all right. I waited, I waited for a few seconds. I thought, well, I know. maybe he's done. <laughs> uh, just a couple more. So, um, so, but I just wanted to get back to this and show you that that query, you now know what the sensitivity and specificity and positive predictive value and negative predictive value are of that query. I mean, it's really quite, amazing in a way, right? When you think about it, um, that a simple query like that, can you can really say exactly what its predicted value is. This slide just kind of gives you a little bit of uh, the substance behind it. It's like, you might be questioning, well, how much does each term contribute, right? I mean, it seems like everybody in the, should get a blood gas that's in the ICU. And this is distributed over lots of different groups. And you can see that some groups, have a lot of blood gases in their medical record, but a lot of them don't, right? So that some of the shorter bars, I don't know if you can see my, oops, going the wrong way. Some of the shorter bars, they, they didn't have blood gases in their medical record yet. And they relied on other parts of that OR statement. So that having a lot of terms in that OR, or statement was really important. Um, and for death as well, as you see there on the right and for ICU and PC on the left. And you might say, well, shouldn't we just take a machine learning approach to this? Because you know, we could easily derive this, not you don't have to go through all this, 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 you know, process of understanding the medical record. You can just do machine learning and figure it out what occurs commonly in the ICU. And the answer is kind of, but the problem is that you get a lot of stray terms like this chlorhexidine gluconate, which is a uh, uh, mouthwash, right? And it's just part of the order set for the mass general Brigham, which is what we did this 
uh, machine learning for, but it gets very, it, it very much overfits many terms and so forth, such that um, you can't use it generally across, you know, the 180 hospital network that we have. And then you can even, and we're just doing this now, using hospital dynamics to figure out things like who was actually admitted for COVID and who was admitted, admitted routinely. You can go to the, the ICU even though you have a routine admission because you know if you have surgery, you're, 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 you're post-op. And you can actually tell that by just the order of tests, right? Just test orders. You can differentiate who's COVID related admission versus a routine admission. So you can use, you can really expand on this and do more and more things using this very approach of just understanding the hospital, understanding how people are doing order sets and so forth to really get a very nice definition. So takeaways are, we need this expert defined proxy uh, uh, for, for defining these kinds of ways that we can um, uh, do queries in the medical record accurately. And we confirm it by chart review. Um, there's a lot of coding differences. And so it's very important to have these, uh, a lot of different codes considered when you're developing definitions like this. Um, site ICU data, if you went by CPTs, you might say, well, I'll use a CPT. Well, it was, it was terrible actually from the hospitals, uh, about 50-50 uh, if you use CPT codes instead of our coding system. And um, be careful with things like machine learning, which are potentially non-generalizable, right? And might give you some very um, uh, overfit solutions. Um, so using uh, Gabe, for example, to uh, tell you what uh, stuff is uh, happening in the ICU and, and base your, 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 your knowledge off of that turns out to be a good idea. All right, so thank you. There you go, Gabe. All right, thank you, everybody. Uh, my name is Gabriel Brad. I'm, I'm a surgeon and intensivist at Beth Israel and uh, one of the faculty at DVMI. Um, I'm going to talk a little about some of the findings that we have from our work. Uh, I just want to make sure because this is always, uh, do you see the screen or the provider notes? The, the main screen. We see your we see your slide. Perfect. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, um, so, uh, as Griffin and Sean mentioned, uh, for um, as of January, we had uh, eight countries. We now have a couple more that have so joined um, our effort. Uh, there are about three hundred and fifty hospitals that are involved uh, uh, across the world. And what I'm going to talk a little bit about is, is about two things. One, I'm going to talk about how uh, we thought um, about using these methods of severity uh, uh, identification, things like that, to give us some insights about patients. Um, but also, I'm going to tell the story of one specific lab as to how uh, we've been able to, to use data around that to, to really think through um, some of the questions that we have around COVID-19. So um, using severity um, as we developed allowed us to start to see the differences that existed in, in countries as it relates to the number of patients who ultimately became severe. You can see that although some of these patterns are relatively similar, each country had its own set of characteristics, its breakdown of patient populations, and even the way in which demographics played a role in those patients who were likely to become severe. And what we did is we took that data and uh, that, that metric that, that uh, we discussed previously, and we used it to uh, evaluate the, whether any specific um, lab or even a combination of labs would be most effective in defining a severity. So if you look at how we as clinicians have used some of these laboratory values, in particular things like D-dimer, C-reactive protein, um, and others were used as thresholds for identifying a patient who might need to be transferred to the ICU. And so we asked the question, do we, can we do a, a good job of identifying patients who are likely to require these kinds of invasive uh, treatments, i.e. intubation, uh, shock management, um, and uh, um, 
uh, and others for the purposes um, of kind of having these thresholds. And what we could show is that yes, um, there are differences and um, using our international data, we were able to get a sense of some of the AUCs related to some of this work. As you can see, these lines are very different, but because of the uh, variation that exists internationally, you can see that some of the AUCs um, are better than others. But overall, even by the use of individual labs, you can show that you can de define populations that are likely to uh, move on to severe disease using even uh, simple laboratory tests. And what I thought was particularly interesting about this work was that not only were we able to do this at, uh, at the individual level uh, or at the hospital level, we were also able to then uh, regress this across different countries and different regions. And if you look at most work, uh, there's a, for example, a living meta-analysis on uh, in the BMJ right now that evaluates the use of risk prediction scores. Um, each, these scores are based on the data that an individual hospital, even a country has available to them. And what we were able to do, which I think is very unique, is we were able to take data across countries and evaluate whether these tools, these risk scores that we had developed would actually function um, across uh, international borders. And we showed that with relative consistency, data from Europe and North America was uh, relatively was the same, which to me speaks to the fact that um, the physiology of many of these patients um, is similar as, a re as it relates to their trajectories of their laboratory values. And so I want to talk about one specific example of what we were able to do with this work. So in um, March, when we started pulling data together, uh, we noticed that uh, the data that you would see across uh, creatinine, for example, um, had very different outcomes, had very different trajectories for different countries. So if you look at France, France had um, a uh, what you would expect to see, which is over time, patients who are in the hospital tend to have higher uh, creatinine levels. Whereas some of the other countries, in particular places like Italy, the data was very different. And um, there are a number of possible causes. We uh, discussed those in, in our digital nature digital medicine paper. Um, but this finding, for example, is, is really fascinating because it, it, it begs the question of what is different between these countries, whether it is the treatment of these patients, which is most likely, or whether it's the physiology the patients are presenting to the hospital. And so we, we've kind of continued to think through that question. And uh, our, one of our groups, the acute kidney injured groups, has really kind of uh, focused on trying to understand why groups, why patients at different hospitals have very different outcomes as it relates to acute kidney injury after COVID-19 infection. And just to give a small uh, uh, visualization of what they're finding is they're finding that one of the things that really drives patients to have or, or is associated with very significant increases of creatinine, even among patients with severe COVID-19, is the use of these novel COVID-19 medications. Now, the causality associated with this is, is obviously not clear at this time. But the fact that we see these very significant differences among these populations allows us to start to ask the kinds of questions that international comparisons uh, enable. The other thing that we've been doing is, is evaluating the longitudinal characteristics of this. So you can see here, this is uh, looking at creatinine um, uh, trajectories early in the uh, pandemic, i.e. Uh, March, April, May, versus late in the pandemic, this is now November, December, and January. And what you can see is that the, the characteristic uh, trajectories of this lab have changed significantly, uh, where patients who are presenting um, are no longer having the kinds of trajectories they were having before. And this is all patients, of course, um, and, uh, but you can also see some of these changes in severe patients. And so this is the same lab looking at it in a different perspective. And you can see that when we look at patients 
who have severe disease that in the center space, the center figure, you can see that there are significant changes from early to late waves as it relates to their presentation. And so these are some of the things that you can see where uh, in different countries, the, the change in the presentation of these patients is actually significant. And, uh, in this case in particular, at least what's most interesting to me is that um, uh, in particular, you can see that some of the differences, while uh, some of them are significant and some of them are not, you can see that there are overall similar trends as it relates to some of these countries. The other thing that we've been able to do, which uh, has really been spearheaded by Tian Chi Kai and her group, is to uh, start thinking about reorganizing uh, whether the outcomes of these patients are based on their physiology or the treatment effects. And so to do this, one of the things that we did was we built essentially a novel type of risk score where we looked at the, the distribution of patients across timelines in the temporal fashion as to whether they uh, developed, um, whether they were high risk, medium risk, or low risk as it related to their likelihood of death. And what you can see is when you trained a model using early data, that model shows the, the characteristics of these patients um, don't change very much with regards to uh, the breakdown but the event rates start to change significantly. And one in particular is interesting here, where you can see that in Bordeaux, um, the, uh, the model had a very different effect when trained across these different institutions uh, relative to the data that we see at MGBVI and then in Northwestern. So overall, what this really kind of uh, highlights are the kinds of questions that we can ask on a patient level basis based on the, the data that we're getting. Now, obviously, we as a Viet are still working through some of, the, um, some of the ramifications of what we're looking at here, but certainly one of the exciting aspects of this work is that it does open up um, the, the possibilities of what kinds of questions we should be asking based on the data that surfaces and the differences that we see among groups. Um, so finally, just to, for these takeaways, I would say that as we talked about international comparisons across labs and time are valuable and potentially really give us um, an, an understanding and difference and an understanding of the differences in patient demographics and hospital care. And really using this kind of comparative method allows us to then uh, uh, generate ideas and opportunities for further granular evaluation to answer some of the really important questions around COVID-19. That's all I have. Thank you, Gabe. Thank you. Uh, oh, go ahead, Griffin. No, just uh, say I, we have, I think, time for um, questions for any of us that there's interest. I actually had a question. Um, uh, so you know, I've been I've been watching this um, from the sidelines, so I'm not in, in the trenches, but. This the analysis that um, Kate Gabe just presented, that was all from the like 1.0, right? Data, the, the first phase of the data. I know you have a 2.0. Great question. Rolling out. So, Go ahead. Yeah, so the some of the data is what technically is 1.1 data. Um, and some of the data, especially some of the patient level thing, like the last slide that I showed comparing different institutions in there. Um, individual breakdowns of event rates within their risk categories. Uh, that, that is 2.1 data um, where we're actually showing the characteristics at the patient level. And how many, how many hospitals did you have for the, the 2.1 data? How many um, hospitals participated in that? So that's, that's a growing group. As of now, there are about, and Griffin, tell me if I'm wrong here, but we have about uh, 12, between 10 and 12 hospitals that have now gotten through the, the quality control methods that we put in place. We've had a number actually in the last couple of weeks who've actually, because of the opportunity that exists of being involved in these granular analyses, 
they have managed to do the work that is necessary to make sure that the quality of their data is sufficiently high so that they actually pass the quality control laws. I'll, I'll point out that there's a little bit of difference between a site and a hospital. Um, we, we have hundreds of hospitals in our network, but often there'll be one person who's collecting data from a bunch of hospitals. So I think we have a dozen or so um, sites, which actually may map to many more hospitals than that. It's, um, we, we have these, again, these kind of two pillars, phases, phase one and phase two. The phase one is um, easy for hospitals that there are sites that are interested to jump in. It doesn't, it's, it's generally not human subject research because it's just aggregate counts and you don't have to install any software, you're just running some SQL scripts. It allows us to very quickly get um, initial results from many institutions. Phase two queries are harder, involving, especially when they're involving chart review, you need appropriate IRB and infrastructure for it, um, but we don't need every site to do it. We need a subset of sites to help us validate um, what we're seeing, and that, that to in-depth review at a subset of sites combined with um, the, the aggregate counts from many sites allows us to um, uh, both have confidence in what we're looking at as well as get um, that international perspective. Anyone else has a question, uh, you can put it in the chat window or you can just unmute yourself and ask it now. Can I ask another question? Just, um, I don't mean to take up all the question time, but so um, Griffin, you said that um, you really only need a subset of, of um, hospitals to participate in the, the more extensive 2.1 to help with the validation. So I, I actually, didn't realize that so that's that's actually pretty neat because I, I what I what I observed is you know there's other groups out there doing this type of research and um, without that validation and without that um, possibility of going back and doing chart review it seems like people are getting stuck so um, it's maybe maybe Sean well, they're, they're gonna be stuck but you know the, the almost greater danger is just not knowing what you don't know you know if Sometimes if you start merging data together and taking it out of context, you're sort of thinking that that's the truth uh, when it's really you're, you're merging different hospital systems, different coding practices, and, um, and you know, you've lost a lot of that knowledge that the, uh, uh, the, we send out these SQL queries aside and each institution has to tweak them a little bit. And you know, we, we make guesses of where your ICU code is or you know, where you're storing race. But you know, they go, no, 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 this is the right way we usually do it, or that data isn't really good quality, you need to verify it in the notes. So having the people locally who really understand this, um, you know, uh, makes it much better than just, you know, we take a look at a pooled set of data and have to um, kind of make the most out of it. Yeah, I mean, you'll find surprising, very surprising things. Um, I mean, probably not surprising to this group, but for all the patients who are coded for diabetes, only about 60% actually have diabetes. So the other 40% do not have diabetes. So you're like, well, how could they possibly be coded? Well, when you drill into it, you figure it out. If you wanna get a glucose tolerance test, which is a test to see if somebody has diabetes, you must code them for diabetes. So it's crazy, right? Now you can figure it out by uh, doing things like we showed on the hospital dynamics where you can count the number of codes and people have lots of codes are, are, are um, you know, you can show with, a, with a, actually a, 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 a analysis uh, called minimum likelihood theory that there's two kinds of phases of patients. There's one which has small numbers of codes and when they're normalized by their hospital um, activity, it, uh, then it'll, it'll get very small. You can, you can actually separate that curve out and say, okay, those are the patients that don't have diabetes. They're coded for diabetes, but they don't have diabetes. And then the other curve is the ones that do. And so you can, you can, you can figure it out, but you need to know at some level, what's the ground truth, right? I mean, who really does and who doesn't? And the only way you can do that is to get into the hospital, into the data and, you know, be able to say, you know, okay, I've read the chart, this patient has diabetes. I've read the chart, this patient doesn't have diabetes. You don't have to do it for everyone, just some subset, even a smallish subset sometimes. And then you'll be able to do the computation accurately. So 
that's really key and it's very important in, in almost every phase of, of, of the research. I'll just make it another um, comment. Um, so I, you know, I've been I've been at this for a long time, and I've been working with the I2B2 team since the you know the since before they even wrote the grant for I2B2 um, and working at hospitals. I've never seen anything like this ramp up so fast. This um, 4C has been in place for just a, a, like a year now, and. Um, the, the thing that's exciting to me is, as being part of this um, foundation is that the majority of the hospitals um, that joined this effort um, had I2B2. I mean, certainly there's OMOP um, participation in, the, in this group as well, but um, Zach was able to reach out to you know, his, his circle of, of, of um, collaborators and folks that he's worked with, um, and they've been able to pull this together really quickly. So, you know, I'm, um, so as part of the foundation, I'm proud of that number one, and um, and and excited to see what's you know what's next. Um, the foundation is um, definitely um, supporting um, this effort in in trying to promote um, you know communication and marketing. So we're we're constantly you know um, sending this the information around this through our social media channels. So um, certainly you know uh, you know follow us on social media. You know retweet this stuff. I think. The more um, people hear about this and, and understand it, I think, um, the more successful it's, it's going to be um, moving forward. Any other questions or comments or? I don't, I don't see anything. <clears throat> Any closing okay. thoughts well, yeah. from Gabe? Sean or Griffin, or you guys are going to sign off for five minutes before your next Zoom meeting. <laughs> you know, I just hope most of the people on the call, you know, uh, are either part of a CTSA or part of a group that can join in. It's yeah. really been great, and I should say uh, Michelle Morris is on the on the call. She's been absolutely critical. Put together all the ontologies. We used the ontologies that were created for ACT by her and Sean. Jeff Klan is on the call, and I know I presented for him. If you want to think of it that way, he he did the work. He's he's been um, amazing, right? In terms of you know, and um, a lot of that uh, infra infrastructure and and cre is to his credit. Um, I mean, it's just been an amazing group that uh, have been able to work together and uh, you know build all of this. Um, HMS, BI Deaconess. Mass General Brigham, uh, Children's, and I mean, across the country, it's been an amazing response. And then internationally, I mean, it's just been, we've had, you know, uh, we've always had a lot of friends in Europe and, 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 and Asia, and, and, and it just, you know, but this is, this, is, this is the way to show it, I guess. And so, you know, it's just a great way for everybody to come together. reminder the the slides and the recording um, will be on the foundation website within the next couple of days so certainly if um, if there's other folks that you want to um, have uh, listen to this um, that will be a, that resource will be available as well anything okay. else I think with that we'll wrap up Diane thank you Sounds good. thanks everyone for joining us and uh, hopefully we'll see you next month same time <laughs>